working? Can you guys hear me? Perfect. All right, thanks for having me. Um, so we'll talk about orthobiologics, and then we're going to talk a little bit. We have an in integration as to how we integrate these biologics sometimes in our surgery as well. Now, this is more surgery-focused. You guys have heard about biologics in general, but there will be some from most information on how we add this to surgery to make it better, okay? So, and again, you guys heard my introduction. Thank you. So these are my disclosures. And this is special thanks to Dr. Brian Cole. So most of my biologics training came from Dr. Cole at Rush in Chicago. You guys may know him. He's probably one of the world's leading experts in orthobiologics, as well as leading experts at cardiac restoration. So I had the pleasure of training with him. I was able to bring that skill set here to Seattle. So the objectives of this presentation, um, really going through the overview, PRP, we're going to look at that, it's used in musculoskeletal medicine. We're going to review stem cells and their use in orthopedics, review how biologics can help surgical outcomes, and then how we combine surgery and biologics to get the patients the best results. So here's the current landscape in 2019. So you have orthobiologic options, you have something called cytokines and proteins. So hopefully we have enough time at the end to talk about that, it's only going to be a brief few slides. Um, we have PRP, and what's most important is you need to understand that there's multiple types of PRP, and we'll get into that later. But you have the leukocyte rich, leukocyte poor, and then you talk about stem cells, which is the sort of fancy stuff people like to talk about because it's all over the news. Uh, but you have autologous. We'll talk more about that because that requires more surgical techniques um, with marrow and adipose tissue or fat cells. And then you have allogenetic adipose, marrow, and cord. You guys have heard a lot about the cord because most of the people in the city who advertise for stem cells are doing the cord stuff because that's called remix. Amniotic fluid. So, what's the need? Well, osteoarthritis is a big problem. 52 million, you just heard about someone talking about replacements. 52 million in the US are diagnosed with OA, and you have 60% are over 65, so that's a big issue. We do over a million joint replacements a year. So, can we find a way to reduce that number slightly? I know the other guys might not like that as much, but in my situation, my whole goal is to prevent knee replacements, shoulder replacements, etc. So, what's the need? Um, so rotator cuff tears also are an issue. So you have 10 to 30 percent of patients, 5.7 million people in the U.S. have rotator cuff tears. We do about 270,000 rotator cuff tears a year. I do about two to three rotator cuff repairs a week easily. So this is a big problem. 40. Here's another issue. Just because you do the repair doesn't mean it's going to do well. 40 to 60 percent re-tear rate at one year by MRI. Now that doesn't mean they're going to need surgery. Um, and I usually quote people about 10 to 15 percent. Um, but this is even done perfectly, you know, every indication possible. So how can we enhance these repairs so they're not failing? Because the second time and the third time are much worse outcomes. Tendonitis and soft tissue injuries, so 66 million healthcare visits for injury, 4.5 million sports injuries requiring medical attention. So as you can see, there's a pretty broad need for a way to enhance this or reduce the need for any surgical intervention for these types of injuries. So what are orthobiologics? Well, there's substance found naturally in your body that help heal more efficiently. You have matrix materials, which are bone grafts or autologous blood, artificial matrix materials. You have growth factors like PRP. You have BMPs and then stem cells, mesochymal, or progenitor. And we'll talk about most of these things in the talk. So what's the problem? Well, I'm not sure if they asked me here for this reason, but to at least talk to you about there's a lot of people out there advertising for stem cells. Stem cell cl clinics are extremely proliferative in the United States. There's 570 sites that advertise therapies for sports injuries, autism, MS. If you look it up and you have a problem, someone will tell you stem cells will work for it. This is just an example of Chicago where I trained. And you can see that's just a number. Those are just the major stem cell clinics. Those aren't affiliated with any type of academic institution. They're mom and pop shops that charge $10,000 for stem cells. And they're clinics that offer all this stuff with direct marketing to consumers. Their language is intentionally imprecise and exploits the vulnerability of patients with debilitating diseases. And the U.S., not surprisingly, has the world's highest density of online stem cell tourism in the world. I spend, being the biologics guy in my group, I spend a, a large amount of my time with patients that come in about biologics to try to convince them not to spend that much money on stem cells or not even to get stem cells alone. So this becomes a real problem even, with, even for someone like me who takes care of patients like this because most of the time I want to offer them a cortisone or even maybe consider a PRP, but not even going down this line. So it's just something to think about. Google hits, 2017. It's a lot. 20 million articles on PRP. 94 million on stem cells. So you can see the financial gain changes things a little bit when people start looking up Google. So here's a problem. You know, we got to divulge what's right information and what's incorrect. PubMed articles is our main source for good, good overall research. 
Uh, you can see the PRP exponentially increased as well as stem cell articles from 1990 to 2016. So what's marketed to us surgeons? Well, you can see here's a number of things. This is from 2018. Anna is our like, second or third largest sports media in the world. Um, and you can see all the different types of implantations we use. And you can see what sort of in-house data or peer-reviewed articles. There's not that many. Novacar, Neocar, Lipogen. So we'll talk about Lipogen. That's sort of the fat. We take fat, spin it down. That's fat cells. Um, and you have all these other options. Renews right here, the injection. So it's multiple anti-inflammatory or other healing factors found in the amniotic tissues. But again, there's limited articles. One, two, peer-reviewed. So this is, again, from that same article. You can see here, look how quickly, now again, this is not all data. This is just what we call good quality data. Look at how precipitously these other options drop off with no data. And you'll see a lot of these advertised for it. The red is what I do in my practice. So overall, I spend a lot of my time, I do Macy. And Macy and ACI are very similar. Macy is just a newer generation, so that's why you got to kind of clump those together. Fresh on Joe Conroe Allograph, we'll talk about that briefly. PRP, I do a number of those as well. Um, and then you also contour allograph transplantation, so fresh from, from, the, from the patient cells. So what's the rationale behind these biologics? Well, there's anabolic and anti-catabolic uh, molecules that modify the arthritic process. So arthritis is obviously the big one we always think about. And most patients can see practice for arthritis. And, re and then the uh, regenerative process. So find a way to regenerate or find a way to preserve cartilage, synovium, stimulate these mesenchymal uh, stem cells, and then stimulate subchondral bone. So here's it. Oh, I'm glad the video's playing. Okay, so look at this. So this is a patient. You can see that's, this is like this is like a 32 year old patient. This is a cartilage defect that they have. All right, it's a bad problem. That's going to be removed. So what do you do with that? So we have this. You have this fresh allograft. So within 24 hours, to, uh, 24 days deceased. We core out a plug. We use something called bone marrow aspirate, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And that enhances the healing. So we soak that in the bone marrow. There's other ways of doing that with the putty. And then we actually implant it into the patient's knee right there to preserve their cartilage. It's got some impressive results, but this is a pretty cool video. Let's see. No, I can play. Oh, it's on a blue load. Anyhow, plug's completely integrated. Again, these, this, the data on this is around 85% return to sport uh, and success, so we're pretty happy with our results. Um, I do usually do bone marrow, but we also consider PRP in some cases as well. So here are the options. Okay, so I don't really cortisone, uh, corticosteroids, and hyaluronic acid are not really options. But when patients come in, this has to be part of the discussion. If they haven't tried these, I'm not going to start offering PRP or other more expensive options that insurance doesn't cover. And so we'll briefly touch on those first two. So steroids, you know, we all know about them. All your friends may have had a cortisone injection. Orthopedic surgeons do a lot of cortisone, uh, corticosteroid injections. So it's good for a problem, but it really is a short-term relief. And there was a recent article that came out. Uh, that show that actually can hurt overall cartilage. We'll, we'll mention that just briefly. So it's not something you just willy-nilly want to give someone an injection of. Again, this is a this is a, our JAOS, one of our um, big journals that we have, a summary, finding that on average it gets about one to two weeks of relief. So that's not really that successful in someone who's got bad arthritis. Again, is there a downside? So this is JAMA. Obviously, you guys know that's good, a very good quality article. Um, randomized control trial. So steroids every three months for 24 months. This is grades three, four. These aren't bone on bone. Okay, that's important. Um, MRI cartilage loss. Now, MRI can over accentuate things, but it's important to understand it. Was around 0.21 millimeters loss versus saline, which is 0.1. So it's not much, but again, at two years, there was a significant loss of cartilage in the treatment group with no significant difference in knee pain. So we're giving people cortisone, we're progressing their arthritis and maybe knee replacement earlier. Now, I'm going to take this with a grain of salt, but it's just something to show you that. Maybe we shouldn't be injecting cortisone all the time in patients. Visco supplementation. Okay, so you guys may have heard about this. Uh, it's called hyaluronic acid. Maybe you've heard booster shots. Maybe you've heard Synvisc. All these different types of the same type of thing. It's hyaluronic acid. So this is from the AOS, the Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, strongly recommending against the use of hyaluronic acid. And you ask why? Well, as a result of this, the annoying, the very frustrating part of our practice is that about two years ago, we used to give these out, we'd give them patients, I've had a number of patients, there's a lot of good data on this, and all of a sudden insurance companies got this, and stopped paying for all of it. So now you have patients that come with arthritis, the only option I have for them is steroids, everything else has to be paid for out of pocket. Some insurance companies are still paying for it, but it's much more difficult. They can't come in the same day and get it, they have to get pre-authorization, et cetera. So it's quite frustrating for the patient experience. 
and mainly because of this article. The problem they have is they had so many different contributions and contributing factors that they didn't exclude or look at, and they made this very strong statement that really hurt the patients themselves. And then another article basically discussing this and saying, you know, did they really miss the mark? And the answer is, I think they did. And here's a JBJS, so those one of our top journals. Closer looking at the evidence of supplementation favors clinically important reductions in pain when higher molecular weight and cross inflammations and is a safe option for patients with knee arthritis. So really, this never should have been taken off insurance claims. And it's a really good option to try to prevent things. Because the next option after this is really PRP, which does have a cost. So now we're going to talk about the fun stuff. People want to talk about PRP. So what is it? Why is it important? So PRP um, has these things called platelet activation release. It releases these factors. And again, um, these growth factors, when activated, um, target certain areas of the body. So you can see here, PGF as a cell growth, new, new generation repair of blood vessels. You have VEGF, which growth in a new generation of um, endothelial cells. TGF beta, um, EGF, and then fibroblastic growth factors of tissue repair, cell growth. This is important. It actually makes hyaluronic acid. So you're actually getting some of the hyaluronic acid when you do PRP as well. So importance. Well, there's multiple applications. So these alpha granules in the platelets, they contain various growth factors and cytokines concentrations equal to platelets. They increase anabolic cytokine activity, again, those, those different growth factors, including insulin growth factor as well, and these different things have effects on the tissues. So this is important to understand. There are multiple system preparations. Whenever there's a product that has financial gain, there's going to be a different number of people that want to talk about all the different ways they can, they can sell you their products better. So there's over 80 PRP machines on the market, different types. Each system differs in time and centrifuge, as well as the number of cycles, and differ in the different platelet type, white blood cells, and growth factors. So it's important for you to understand this because, because patients don't understand that, and all the research studies, a lot of the studies will see that all different types of, there's never really a benchmark to how they're preparing the PRP. Now, in general, in this area, most people use a machine called uh, by Arthrex, uh, that's what we use, uh, ACP, and it's actually a pretty good standard standard of care, and it's one I've used across the United States, so that's a pretty good one, but in general, there's a number of different ones that can market, and each one has a different supplementation it comes out with. And again, be careful, they're not all the same. You can see up here, these are the different formulas, different levels of platelets, different levels of leukocytes or white blood cells, and different levels of red blood cells. This is from every single different type of spin from the machine, so look how variable it is. So what do the spin types mean? Well, there's PRP, there's single spin and double spin. Okay, so the single spin, okay, we're going to talk about this. This is the leukocyte poor, right? So this is mostly arthritis, we'll mention that, versus leukocyte rich, which is the double spin. So it's less platelets, fewer white blood cells. It's called the centrifuge ACP. It's faster and cheaper, so that's important to understand. Because patients are, that should get the other one are getting this one because it's cheaper for the doctors to give it to them. So I have both machines in my office. I have this one, and then I have this machine too. So when I need to give them a certain type of PRP for arthritis, I give them that. When I need to give them one for tendons, I give them the different type. But I just had a lady who had a hamstring done, supposed to be done with the leukocyte rich, based on all the studies we'll talk about, and we just and got poor, so clearly there was really no, no one really actually knew what was going on when they gave it to her. And so it's important for you to pay, understand that there's a difference, and that you need both machines. Now you can do the poor with the rich, but these kits are more expensive, so most people will not give a poor, uh, you know, with leukocyte poor, from this machine. So that's something to understand about the why people are getting what they're getting and there's a reason behind it. So what is this poor, rich thing? This is confusing, explain it. So we have leukocyte poor PRP. It has a reasonable amount of platelets but very low white blood cells. And that's what you want to be a someone with arthritis. You don't want to cause a lot of inflammation and make their knee more painful. Meanwhile, there's pure PRP, which we're not going to talk about as much today. And then leukocyte rich. So this is important. It's got a lot of platelets. A lot more platelets than leukocyte 4, but it has a lot of white blood cells. And so as a result, you want this for healing potential. So tendons, things like that are much more important. You want to stimulate a response. A lot of patients will tell you they get some inflammatory response after a PRP injection, but it depends on which one they're getting. So patients they usually get the tendon one. This is quite painful to get the injection with a PRP leukocyte rich, but it also has better results in certain different things, which we'll show. So what are the effects on the human synoviocyte, so human um, particular cartilage? So you can see again, we're going to talk about rich and poor, so hopefully you guys better understand it by the end. The leukocyte poor has mostly anti-inflammatory uh, properties. Leukocyte rich has mostly inflammatory properties, based off these things, sorry, the colorings 
off. So that's important for you to understand. So what are its effects on tendon tissue? So it increases this PGF and um, TGF beta, which are areas that are essential to healing. It increases the VEGF, so it increases vascularity of the injury site. And then it acts to enhance the tenocyte proliferation. So in vitro, we assume earlier healing, superior quality of healed tendon, and better organization of fibroblasts and collagen. So what's the basic science behind this? Again, I'm not going to go through all the articles here, but you can see the summary from this is it's reduced inflammation, you get these myoblasts to differentiate, they proliferate, they build their diameter, gets larger, and they shorten recovery time. So look at the proliferation. ACP is that one I told you about, the leukocyte core, but you can see how much faster that increases the myocyte proliferation versus the control in the negative themselves. So we're going to talk about more of the fun stuff, which is the clinical aspect. So PRP and muscle injury. Again, literature suggests that PRP may result in earlier return to sport for acute grade one, two muscle strains. Now again, take this with a caveat. This is, these injections can cost any patients anywhere from $800 to $1,200. So it depends on the person that you're offering this to, because whether it's statistically significant or not does not matter. Now, if a person's a professional athlete, you get it back two games longer and they have a $10 million contract, there's a big difference there. If a patient's like, oh, I want to go, I don't want to play hockey for six months, there might not be a difference even if you see this. So it's something that I always talk to the patients about. The financial part does matter, people, and it should be part of the consideration. So again, this is looking at PRP. Now again, you want to start comparing it to different things. So compared to saline, compared to gel shots, etc. So this is looking at PRP versus saline. 15 per group, in case of small cohort, three weekly injections. We're going to talk about the type of injections and number. Improvement at 12 months, 78% more improvement in PRP versus only 7% in saline. So essentially placebo. And you can see PRP's effect really starts kicking in around the two week or so mark. I tell patients the PRP takes around four weeks when they start feeling effect. So here's hyaluronic acid, so gel shots versus PRP. Double blind, randomized controlled trial, 50 and 50, so we're getting better numbers. Again, you can see here, PRP's on the top. If you want it to be higher, at least have the scores. And you can see PRP really kicks in around the five, four week mark, which is what we expect. And at 6 and 12 months, which is really more important for the patients because no one wants to pay for this or have this done to them and only get you know, four or eight weeks of relief, they're seeing statistically significant improvements. And also fast scores, so that's how much pain they're in. These are all done under ultrasound, so that's a difference of opinion of how you want to do it. Um, and the difference of opinion that we feel comfortable doing it with uh, regular versus ultrasound. So again, talk about this rich versus poor, so we kind of open this up already. So you can see here, here's a really good, um, this is a meta-analysis and a systematic review of this, looking at treatment for arthritis. Okay, this is mainly arthritis we're focusing on now. So leukocyte core is significantly better than gel shots, PRP, or placebo. And this is comparing, you can see the studies down here, HA is the gel shots, placebo, and then here's one where they actually compared leukocyte rich versus poor. Sorry, there's a little block in me, blocking the way. Um, what you can see, and again, leukocyte core is the majority of the comparisons they're using. So how about a combo? So let's make this more confusing. So if you actually add the two together, you can have a synergistic effect, and there's some studies that show that. Where I trained in Rush, the number one combo, obviously, there's finances are always in a part of the discussion, was three hyaluronic and three PRP at the same time. Most of the guys in the city are doing usually three PRP at a time. Um, and may or may not be adding the hyaluronic acid, but the studies show that the combo is more effective. Again, though, it's just more volume and then obviously more cost by adding that six total injections you have to pay for. And if it's not covered by insurance, that can be quite frustrating. So PRP versus HA again. Again, this is treatment for, so early versus late. This is really important. Non-randomized, okay, so that's something negative, I guess. PRP, 50 people with three injections at a time versus hyaluronic acid. At two months and six months, the PRP was significantly better than the hyaluronic acid. But again, it worsened with age and it worsened with severity. So you've seen those pictures maybe on the news where someone shows like a patient has no joint space left and they like got better by stem cells and then they, everyone tries to go to that clinic to make themselves better. Again, this, I don't do this for patients that have grade four arthritis. These are patients generally that tell me, okay, I can run two or three miles, it starts to swell up on me. Their arthritis is maybe moderate, so grade two, maybe grade three. Um, and these are the patients that will really benefit. The ones that already have a stuck knee where they can't extend their knee, or they're complaining of a ton of pain, they can barely walk, they're not going to get better with PRP. So your selection is important if you want to have half patients. So how about the number of injections? So you keep hearing this three number. 
So again, here's a guinea pig study. This is pretty new out of AJSM, showing 36 pigs. There's three treatment arms. So they gave them control, which is nothing. One is one PRP injection, and one is three PRP injections. And you can see at three months, well, the one and three did well. But at six months, the three combo was much better. So the longevity lasts by adding that, those two extra injections, and that's the thought process behind that. And you can see here, that's what the scores are. So you can see you want a low articular score. So the G2 at three months and G1 are very similar. But then here you can see it still stays the same level, but the other two start coming up similar to the controls. So this is a really brief summary. I'm sorry it's a little blurry. Um, but this is from Anna, again, Dr. Drake, who is quite an expert at this as well from San Francisco. Um, but PRP outcomes for OA. So again, look at the box over here. I tried to highlight it for you. You can say significant difference for four, for three, four out of the six. Now the problem is, look at the two there. One is double spin leukocyte rich. We talked about that not being a good option. So clearly that they missed the vote on doing that. But again, this is a little bit over step. On 2012, again, leukocyte rich did worse. So you can see here, it matters what you get. And if the petition, the number of people that come into my office and say, oh, my doctor told me about PRP. And they wanted to give it to me, but I read your stuff and I want to see yours to talk more about it. I'm like, well, they tell you about the two types. And they're like, no, I don't think they, that they know what's going on there. And that's important to understand that because if someone starts giving them a little side four, they're not going to do well and they're going to spend that money on a PRP injection. It's not going to be effective. So, PRP and lateral epicondylitis. So, here are some studies here. Again, this is something that I still offer patients. And so, so, you have this one from 2013. It's equal effectiveness to controls. So, there's one study where it's not as good that is equivalent or better at six months. So it takes a little while for this to sort of be the advanced option. This is 2014, 2011, better, better dash scores and um, pass scores. Now again, it's compared to glucose injections, not to steroids. And then PRP, better dash scores at one year. So you can see the longevity is there, one to two years. This is the same, this is a study that came out last, literally last three weeks ago, so I thought I'd put it here for you guys so you can see it. This is an outline again of those studies, adding a couple more. You can see here now, what's interesting about the first study is they compared PRP to actual surgery, which I think is really not a fair comparison because that's usually the end result. So obviously PRP did not do as well as surgery in that option. I would never compare those two for patients, but this one here, you can see almost all of them except for maybe the bottom one. Uh, there's two out of the four here, again, that were statistically significant improvements in pain scores. And those were actually compared to um, lidocaine and corticosteroids, so that's a good one too. So we've compared it to glucose, which is placebo, and compared it to corticosteroids, and in most cases, it has a benefit. How about patella tendonitis? So there's the three, these are the three studies you can see here. Dragu again, 2014, 23% participants. So these aren't very large studies, unfortunately, um, and uh, better at 12 weeks, and equal at 26. So it did burn out after a certain period of time. This one is uh, 28 people in 2012, three month follow up, all, almost all of them are back to sport. Now, patella tendonitis, when it gets to this point, is very frustrating. I mean, these patients are basically one step away from needing surgery because they can't do anything. And so, that's actually pretty good. They're only at 21 or 20 years back. Um, and in my practice, I've had about, I would say, I'm about 75 to 80 percent success with PRP. Now, again, they tried steroids, they tried a ton of rehab, and they finally come to me. So, of those, of those, Patients, I think maybe one or two, or maybe a handful, eventually get the agreement. All right, so let's talk about rotator cuff repair. So rotator cuff repair, PRP doesn't work very well for it. So you can see here, these are big, big studies. You know, we have 1,100 people on that one, 900 in the others. There's two that I marked here. They wrote there was some better pain scores, but no better healing in all of these studies. And that's important to understand because the pain part is important. Obviously, you don't want patients to be in pain. But after six months, majority, or six weeks, the majority of patients have minimum pain. So is it really worth that injection to do it for them? And then also the question is, when did you do the injection? Did you do it right after the surgery? Well, or during the surgery? Because if you do it during the surgery, you inject them, and you have fluid still in there from the arthroscopy. Is it actually even going in? So there's some questions to always talk about with the methods here. So in general, I would not recommend PRP for any type of rotator cuff issues. How about UCL? So you guys have heard about this with baseball players. This is the Tommy John ligament. So here's three studies. Again, um, dines of the two. So look at this again. Remember, it's a ligament. So it's a ligament or a tendon. So it should be done with rich. So you have the first one deal. Really good results. Okay, 91% because these players, they have tears. 
they don't, if they take it back to throwing, they're getting a reconstruction, or they're getting something that we now do as a repair, but they're getting surgery. So if to offer a PRP option, hopefully to avoid these players from having to need surgery is a big deal, and they're in the college or professional level, it's even a bigger deal. No college player, no professional player is going to make it, with a partial tear, is going to make it to surgery without trying a PRP injection first. Dines, now he didn't have as good a results, but he had a pretty low study, only six patients. And again, he used looks like four, so that's really not a, as good of a comparison. And then what I out here had really good results, 88% return to sports. So those are quite good. So in my baseball players, high school or above pitchers, I will often in PRP as an option if they fail the return term. I will not do a cortisone injection because I do not want to damage that ligament anymore in this type of situation. So PRP media stairs. So 80 patients, okay, again, they compared steroids, ultrasound guided, versus PRP, leukocyte bridge. Grade one, two, ten, these aren't complete tears. The, the steroids maxed out at six weeks, which is about what I'm talking about. And as you can see here, the PRP was continued to be system significant throughout the rest of the next 52 weeks, almost two years, they followed these patients. So it's interesting, it's actually interesting, this study came out in like two weeks after it, I had one of these, uh, one guy come to my office actually with this, and he had been suffering for like, this is an anecdotal, but he had been suffering for three or four months. And again, the PRP injection, it was amazing that literally in four or five weeks, he was getting significant improvement. That's also one of, my, one of my scheduler's best friends, so I was really happy about that. Okay, so here's one. I'll try to explain this slide. It's a little bit confusing, but a lot of patients, okay, so people always ask, can I get a PRP injection and get my meniscus fixed? Well, not really. I don't, it doesn't work like that. It's a synergistic effect. So you can see here, so the, let's explain this better. When you have an ACL tear and you do a meniscus repair, the data shows it's significantly improved for repair quality because you have all that blood from the ACL going in and therefore there's stem cells and et cetera and it heals better. Now, they found when you add PRP and ACL with a meniscus repair, there's no benefit. But if the patients had a meniscus repair and PRP without the ACL, they had a significant improvement from overall. So we say about 70, I tell patients 70% success from meniscus repairs in isolation. And you can see that by the, it says the PRP with no ACL, that's the large dark, uh, dark line at the top, which is pretty impressive, that's PRP. With no PRP, you can see it drop off significantly, which almost about a 12 to 15% improvement with the PRP. So that's an impressive article, I was happy to see this. I'm still not operating this in my practice um, because the only negative about this is there's something called microfracturing of the notch where you stimulate it, and they didn't look at this, but it's just something to show you. So hamstring tears, people you come in and have hamstring pull, etc. Now this I think relates more to the professional athletes because return to play was only about 20 days or so better with the PRP, and pain was better. Now we'll try, I'll still try PRP for someone who's failed everything else for surgery, because these are partial tears or small tears, not ones that need to be fixed surgically. So the last thing I want to do is offer them a surgery if I think I think I've even a shot of making it better with the PRP. Uh, but definitely this 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 makes sense. I mean, you'll know any of those professional athletes, they're getting PRP. I mean, um, the linebacker for the Seahawks does it as his routine for a sur before the before the, uh, the year starts. It's sort of a flush out, which I wouldn't recommend always, but this is something to think about. <coughs> okay, so it's not from PRP. Now, we're here to talk about this rule. Hopefully, everybody's not put to sleep yet. Um, we'll do some fun stuff briefly, and then we'll try to jump on. How are we doing with time? Okay, we'll go quickly. All right, so again, this is the how I decide and all the other options, okay? So, to breathe in, first line for in season athletes, okay? You don't want to do anything fancy with them. I think you can just get them cleaned up and get them back on the field if possible without hoping they're not going to do too much damage. Microfracture, again, those are poking holes in the bone, generally very small defects. Something called biocars we'll talk about, that's for moderate sized defects. And then osteochondral allograms transplantation at their own cartilage, those are those little plugs over there. Those are for high demand athletes for smaller defects. You may see something where we take the cartilage, biopsy it, throw it in the lab, and stick it on like glue on the sheet. You can see that right there where it's sutured, and that grows in mostly that for patella or trochlear defects. And then for the condyle, it's usually osteochondral allograft, which is generally the go-to. And even since this slide was made a year or two ago, it's coming even more aggressive that we sort of go down to that line because the data is so good on those. So bar cartilage, what is it? It's like microfracture plus. So you've heard of microfracture? Well, we add this to the microfracture and it brings the rates up from like 65% to 80% healing. So I generally won't even do microfracture. I'll only offer this option with the microfracture because the data is so much better. 
And again, here you can see the model here with Brian Coles on this one. Repair scores, you see when you add microfracture, right there, you see the improvement. I mean, when you add biocartilage, you see the improvement over there, and here's the histology on that. So how about Macy's? This is the one I told you about regarding the lab, have a sheet of cartilage pasted on there. Again, these are difficult situations. This is patella defects and defects of the trophia, the groove, you see 73%, again, better than microfracture. Microfracture deteriorates in two years in ACI or Macy's that people use on. How about osteochondral transplants? Those, those big cartilage plugs I showed you earlier. 75 to 80%, 88% return to sport. We're talking about 85% at 10 years, which is pretty impressive. These are big problems to have, and they'll continue to chew up the meniscus, chew up the cartilage below if you don't take care of these mechanical issues or the pain. So these are really satisfying patients. Again, it's a long haul, seven, eight month recovery on this type of surgery. How about is there an indication? Well, there isn't really. Obviously, we push the envelope. It's a young patient, I'll do bigger plugs. Older patients, fit, above 50 years old, will probably start thinking about doing a knee replacement because does it really work? The seven, eight month recovery, it's a lot bigger toll on the body also when you do these. And again, there isn't really an age cutoff either. Mine's actually uh, 50 with newer data that's coming out. Um, but it depends on the patient. Isolated cartilage, otherwise there's certain factors that have to go into play. Generally under 40 is pretty much I'll try, I'll try as much as possible to preserve their joint. So stem cells. So there's a number of types listed here. And how do we think they work traditionally? Well, there's these three different, you know, endodermal, mesodermal, and again, they differentiate, and hopefully you can put them in, and then they'll regrow your cartilage. At least that's what they say on the internet. So contemporary thinking is it's not true, but they really do. These stem cells, you can't, we can't get those stem cells because those don't exist, at least in our ability right now. So we modulate the local environment, decrease inflammation, recruit other stem cells, and release growth factors. Essentially, it's like really potent anti-inflammatory. So there's bone marrow and adipose we'll talk about today very briefly. And again, we don't have time to go through the whole video, but that's how we take it from the bone marrow. Um, and there's two different, you can do surgical delivery or you can do it intra-articularly injections. So again, this is its effects on cartilage defects and OA. So those are the two main things that it's been looked at and really it's shown some improvement in. So you can see marrow cells right here, improved clinical outcomes, improved Bocard scores. That's with taking bone marrow aspirin. This is adipose tissue, it's, like a, it's actually like a liposuction. You stick a large needle in someone's stomach, it doesn't sound very fun. And then, uh, and then you actually remove the fat, shake it up, and then inject it back in the knee. Yeah. That's why a surgeon has to do it, and I, I've done it a number of times, and so every time I do it, it freaks me out. So. <laughs> uh, it missed, but it has good scores on WOMAC, decreased defect size overall, and increased cartilage. Again, almost all these studies, it's a surgery with this, so it's always hard to tell exactly what the benefit is. But look what you have to do. I mean, this patient's on the table. We have to do the little liposuction on their knee, on, on their stomach, and then inject this fat back in. Again, there is some data. This is more European studies. Increased prostaglandin synthesis. This is level four data that shows that, so it's not the greatest data. It shows some improvement overall. I did this in my fellowship. I don't do these liposuctions now. I don't think it's really a benefit. I do, I do bone marrow if I need to for cartilage stuff, for high-level athletes, et cetera. So I lean towards bone marrow um, aspirin. Um, these are the different devices. Again, a lot of devices to do this. The Angel's Nice, which is the Arthrex one, because it can do PRP and bone marrow, and it can do all three types. So it's sort of a one size fits all option. So we use that one, and most people use the uh, Arthrex one. So where do you go? Okay, well, we just talked about stem cells, but what do we do? Well, you have three options. You can take it from the tibia. So if you're working on the knee, you can take it right here. If you're working on the shoulder, you can take it from here. But the, the gold standard is iliac crest. It's so scary because someone's putting a needle right into the pelvis, and we're not pelvis doctors, we're sports doctors that are taking it, or people are taking it and are not as comfortable with it. So you have to have a lot of experience doing this, uh, to feel comfortable doing this type of trocar, especially because it's just percutaneous like that. Uh, but generally, any professional athlete always doing it on that crest. You know, in general, it depends on the patient, I'll talk to them about it, because they might not want to poke down here. Um, the best stem cells, the best bio, uh, biologics are from the that crest. So again, here's some very brief data we'll go over. Uh, but these are conjugal injuries, so there's encouraging data that shows it is some improvement. Again, these are focal cartilage defects, so they're different. So again, some improvement, but again, they're all in combination with other things. So these people have alignment issues, other things. They have all these really fancy surgeries we don't have time to talk about. And this is, again, cartilage defects, so there's eight studies. So overall, though, there's still a paucity of high-quality literature. So bone marrow aspirin's safe, as long as you know what you're doing with the harvest. 
but recommend initial use until better evidence exists. So really, I try not to do as much as possible. I'm a PRP guy, I do most of that. It costs as much less patients too, especially when they run out of options from cortisone and all that. So adipose tissue, which is the fat versus bone marrow. Again, there's not really a clear winner, but the most of the more effective hematopoietic stem cells I think makes a difference, and that's why I'm going towards bone marrow. Really briefly, just rotator cuff, so this is Hernigo. So anytime Hernigo puts a study out, there's always strong significance. He's, uh, I can't remember he's from, but somewhere in Europe, but he always has impressive data. So just take that with a grain of salt. The patients without tears have almost three times as many stem cells as those with tears. So you can see the difference. So he found that if he had bone or aspirin combined with the rotator cuff repair, that he had significantly improved healing. 87% versus 44% at 10 years. So that's good data. That's impressive. Again, we didn't publish in the top journal, so always the question is, you know, why was this not accepted to the higher level stuff? But it's just something to think about. So in conclusion, you know, you have this, and we'll have, we have time, we have orthokines after this, but we just have time, I think we're running over. So, um, you know, here's basically, I do PRP leukocyte core for OA, Bomar aspirin, occasionally, maybe higher level athletes where like one, one game sooner makes a difference. And then for rotator cuffs, again, there's not a lot of data on rotator cuffs, and I would not recommend it uh, for that situation. And you talked about the other stuff. And this is a pocket guideline. No one's going to have time to read through all this stuff. But exercise increases PRP levels. And there you go.